Okay, let's open a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for today. We pray that you bless our time together and uh, pray that you'll help us to have insight into uh, some of the topics that we're talking about in terms of Bible prophecy. Uh, bless our time together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm going to call this the pause before the storm. And the only reason I could think of that was, you know, it, it's, it's gray, it's dark, it's cloudy here in Columbus, and Ohio State lost to Michigan. So that's like, uh, everybody's upset today, and uh, they got they got whooped, um, especially in that say I went and played golf, and so I didn't watch any of it. And uh, I came home, it looked close, and I turned around and did something, and it wasn't. So listen, this is uh, soon going to be irrelevant, but we talk a lot about the convergence of events, and um, let me just make a preliminary comment. Well, we talk, I talk about acceleration, convergent, logistics, understanding, particularly a lot based on this verse in Daniel about at the end time there will be uh, people that the wise will understand and instruct the many, but the wicked will never understand. So, and it doesn't say instruct the many here, instruct many here, it says it over in, in uh, prior passage in Daniel chapter 11, around verse 33 or 34, and it's, it's, it's very interesting to watch this, because I talk to a lot of different people. Uh, I have a lot of friends, uh, and it's very interesting. Everybody has different views of the end times. I personally think that um, this is still to be fulfilled, although this week people were sending me articles that this has been fulfilled, and everybody knows everything about the end times now. Particularly, this one man said, if you follow what I've written, uh, you'll understand exactly how everything is supposed to be uh, supposed to happen. And this is the case. So I'm all for learning. I'm all for discussing these different ideas. Uh, sometimes I don't like the level of uh, vitriol that I see uh, being back and forth. And at some point, your view on a certain thing will be so obviously wrong that it's going to need to be dealt with. And and we'll have to work that out when we get to that time. And whether that time's when I'm still alive or not, I don't know. You know, I, I thought this would have wrapped up a while ago. And I think the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of people are looking at things and we're sort of like, you know, I didn't really expect, to be honest, I didn't really expect to see this. And if we're honest, I've been involved in the prophecy community for a lot long time. I've spoken at a lot of conferences, um, and I've met a lot of other people, and I don't know anybody that really called what's gone on in the world the last three years, called it with any specificity. So I think that's a sign that we need to be a little bit humble about how these things are going uh, to work out. So uh, again, I will just remind you of this verse that we look at, because I'm going to talk about this first uh, part, but know this that in the last days is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households, and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was." So let's um, just look at some of the things. You know, there's this strange thing in the weather. This is Buffalo, New York. Uh, last week, um, they had to move the Buffalo, Cleveland at Buffalo game from Orchard Park, New York, because Orchard Park got 77 inches of snow in one storm. Uh, that's a lot of snow. <laughs> uh, taller, as tall as the uh, Buffalo Bills quarterback. Uh, but here it's been pretty nice. I mean, I play golf uh, 
uh, Friday and Saturday, um, and it, it, was, it was pretty good. Uh, another thing that's going on is there's droughts all over the place. I've seen pictures of Lake Shasta, Northern California. Of course, we've talked about Lake Mead, Lake Powell. Uh, they're still down, massive drought in the desert southwest. They've had a little bit of relief from that. But um, it's still a problem, and it's affecting crops and that type of thing. Here's an article from the New York Times this morning about uh, water wars going on in France because of the drought. Uh, so now this is um, an article that I read. So I'm going to be careful because of the censors as to how we talk about this. Um, my friend Tony and I at Minute to Midnight did a talk last Tuesday, and we talked about this. It's up on Rumble at Minute to Midnight channel if you want to look at that. We talked about this a little bit more detail because people keep getting uh, censored by YouTube and their channel's taken down, and we want to do this. So here's the article, Charlie Vector uh, Treatments and the Misinterpretation of Perceived Side Effects uh, Affects Clarity on the Safety of State-Approved Treatments. And it's interesting. So look at what this... Here's the conclusion in this article. Fear-mongering and misinformation being peddled by people with no scientific training to terrorize people of terrorize. They spell it with an S. So I think it, this comes from Australia. People into staying, not getting the treatment, is not just causing people to remain susceptible to uh, Charlie Vector outbreaks, but could also be causing more side effects seen in the state-approved treatment process. In other words... Because of the disinformation, essentially the premise of the article is this. Um, people are spreading disinformation about this state-approved treatment, and that's causing people stress. And so as a result of that, the stress, that's why people are having, it's not side effects, they're having, the stress is causing them to have a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. And so they say this, this... Uh, this brief review will offer data that may demonstrate that misinformation perpetuated by uh, this movement may be causing more deaths and side effects than any state-approved treatment is. Now, folks, that's just absolutely ludicrous. That's what uh, they would call, uh, I read that to my dear wife last night, and she said, stop gaslighting me. Um, and that's what they're doing is they're trying to make you question what you're thinking. Now, related to this is this term that's come up. It's being used in academia, I think, uh, in sort of the pseudo-intellectual left-wing newspapers like the Atlantic and that type of thing talk about it, stochastic terrorism. So here's the definition of it. And look, listen to the definition of it, and you can kind of get an idea of the, the sort of lunacy that we're going on that Science is not really science, just as I read that article to you. They say it's based on data, but it's not science. It's just absolute nonsense. And, and that, that thing is being excoriated, that article that I just showed you, all over the Internet, Twitter, every place today. But, so this is the definition of stochastic terrorism. The public demonization of a person or group resulting in the incitement of a violent act, which is statistically probable, but whose specifics cannot be predicted. So the lone wolf attack was apparently influenced by the rhetoric of stochastic terrorism. That's an example of how it's used. And so this is what they do all the time. They blame people who criticize something that is worthy of criticism from a cultural, theological basis. And then if anything happens, you're the cause of it. It's, you're, you're a terrorist. It's all this misinformation, disinformation thing. We had the Department of Homeland Security set up a whole thing about this. And part of this relates to the guy they really like to go after is Christopher Rufo, who writes at City Journal and also at his own uh, blog, uh, Christopher, e., Christopher F. Rufo. And so he has this article up at City Journal uh, in the current issue the real story behind Drag Queen Story Hour. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he goes through in excruciating detail and talks about where this came from, what the results of it, you know, how, how does it come about, how is it that this is happening all at once, everywhere, all over the place. 
I have to be honest with you, I have a number of videos of what goes on at these drag queen story hours. I cannot play them. We're at church. It, it is, if not completely, it is certainly at least borderline or over the borderline of pornography. And they are doing this in front of little tiny children. And so people on the right, the conservatives, evangelicals, church people, people who believe in the Bible, says, we're like, you're grooming young kids for this. And then something happens, and what do they do? You're at fault. So this last Sunday or Saturday uh, evening, I didn't really talk about it, was a shooting in Colorado Springs at a LGBTQ-oriented bar that supposedly was this week to have it like a drag queen, get to know a drag queen thing for kids. And the guy went in and shot it up, killed five people, uh, was arrested. Uh, it was interesting after his arrest, um, this is a very troubled individual. I mean, you can just look at the, you can go watch the video of him when he's being arraigned by the judge. This guy is messed up. And so what, what's the narrative now? Oh, he's a Trump supporter, he's MAGA, he's a you know, Christian, and that type of thing, even though his father's like a porn star uh, and a drug addict. And this, it's clear this kid has a drug problem. In the briefs, though, his attorneys came out and said that he wanted to be recognized by the court is non-binary and referred to as they, them. Now, it may be that the, the attorneys are being clever, that this is a way to get him off. There's some hate crime, bias-motivated crimes that he's been charged with, and they're going to say, well, how can he be biased against people that he's part of? That's, that's the way the argument would go. So on CNN the other day, they had a person... Uh, they ask a person, he's identifying as non-binary. What do you think of that? So I want you to watch the person who's answering these questions. It, you know, if, if you're writing a comic script, comedy script, it would be hard to outdo this. Natalie, when we started the show, we just got, we got a little bit of news earlier that the attorneys for the shooter... Um, are now saying that the shooter is non-binary and the shooter, the shooter uh, would like to use the pronouns they, them. And this is for the court in all court papers. And that's what um, Anderson Aldrich's attorneys are saying. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's um, complete ludicrous. <laughs> Um, I believe they're just saying that because they want to have um, the easy way out on this. Um, that's really, really um, offending, especially being a transgender woman myself, that a male, which it was obvious with the mugshot, that's a man. That's not a non-binary person because in no way, shape or form, could they appear as a woman the next day? Um, it's really offensive to even hear that, that they're playing that role. Um, and if they're non-binary, why would you go after the club where you feel safe at? Why would you do that to a community where you are welcomed in if you are non-binary? Excellent question. Obviously, all of this will have to be answered. Okay, so that's a man says, well, he obviously he's not a man, or he's obviously a man, to which I would say, I think I could apply that rule to you. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you're having problems with this. It, it, you understand that this is sort of like, um, you know, if we put it in the biblical terms of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, it's like, I, I don't know that Lot had to deal with this. You know, he was, he was uh, vexed by what he saw anyway. And so I think it's okay to be vexed. It's okay to be upset by this because it goes so against God's design. But it's sort of like I bring somebody on who is a man 
claiming to be a woman, but then he criticizes this non-binary person. And I don't think they even understand what the whole non-binary concept means. So he's charged. So then that led to this exchange, about three minutes on MSNBC, because it's Ben Collins and the crew at Morning Joe talking about this. And Tucker Carlson came out, and he was very critical of uh, people on MSNBC who were saying, you know, this was all the fault of Christopher Rufo or Tucker Carlson or people that the shooting that actually occurred in Colorado Springs because, well, you've criticized people, therefore you can't do this. Now, my question would be if somebody shoots Tucker Carlson, are these people liable, responsible for it because they've criticized Tucker? The whole thing, it gets. It, it's it's really silly, but I think it's important that we listen to a little bit of what they say. So here's the crew at MSNBC talking about this. This will start here in a second. Here are some headlines that I wrote the last six times. months. Fueled by Internet's far-right machine, anti-LGBTQ threats shut down trans rights and drag events. Remember, uh, there was a drag event happening in Colorado. Yeah. Anti-trans stalkers at Kiwi Farms, which is a uh, uh, anti-trans website that stalks people, are chasing one victim around the world. Their list of targets is growing. That was a couple months ago. Doctors under threat from far-right activists for providing trans care. Boston Children's Hospital faces bomb threat after right-wing harassment campaign. There were three of those bomb threats. FBI charges Massachusetts women with Boston Children's Hospital bomb threats, so they found one of the people. At least 20 Republican politicians have claimed that schools are making accommodations for students who identify as cats. That was before. By the um, way, that is true. Midterms. Here are some. Here are three more from my colleagues in the last uh, three weeks. As election nears, some conservative groups have ramped up anti-trans campaign ads. Far-right figures appear to be testing Twitter's boundaries for anti-LGBTQ speech. GOP uh, senator targets TikTok influencer with anti-transgender taunts. And I'm just wondering, what could I have done different? Seriously, as reporters, what can we do different? Because there are five dead people. In a strip mall, because that was the only place they It'd felt safe as gay or trans people what can we do in this town in Colorado Springs. And I am trying to thread this needle here. I'm trying to say that this is happening. This targeted stuff has real life impacts. They say on the Internet has real life impacts. And I'm going to fail, by the way. I'm going to you know, freak out because it's happening, because I wake, I wake up and I see that there are five dead bodies. But I think we have to have a come to Jesus moment here. Uh, as reporters, are we more afraid of being on Breitbart for saying that trans people deserve to be alive? Or are we more afraid of the dead people? Because I'm more afraid of the dead people. I don't want, I, I don't want to wake up on a Sunday and see that all of these headlines came to fruition. Well, what, do, what do we do about public officials at local level, state level, federal level, who try to inject the fear of the very word transgender into school issues? that a transgender person might be trying to be on your son's or daughter's softball team. Right, and that's the and biggest it, worry, right? It can't be allowed. Right. They're dangerous. Why are they dangerous? We never probe, we never probe the motive of these politicians who cheaply, absurdly, and evilly throw that, th throw that issue around. Right, because of the attention economy that we live in means they get more clicks for it. And they end up on Tucker Carlson. They end up on the highest rated show on cable news. And last night, by the way, Tucker uh, attacked my colleague Brandy Zadrozny, who was co on almost all of these stories. Not me. He attacked Brandy, of course. But he, he attacked Brandy. Um, and he, he went right back into this idea that some they is trying to groom your kids, trying to sexualize your children, right? Yeah. Who's the they, first of all? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Well, who's the they? You, you're the they. The teachers that are doing this are the they. Do you understand, I know you do, this is a rhetorical question, how far apart we are on a moral issue? So like, well, I don't even understand why people are complaining about it. You think it's okay for a male to go in a locker room and undress with your daughter? You're a fool. You're, you're, you're what's described in Romans chapter 1. You are under God's judgment. 
God has removed reason from your mind. I agree with Ben Collins on one thing. Now, Ben Collins was a speechwriter for Barack Obama. He was one of the big pushers behind the Iran nuclear JCPOA deal. Uh, before he went to work for Barack Obama, he wrote children's uh, fiction books. And I'm like, that was perfect training for Obama, of being Obama's speechwriter, to write more fiction. So I agree with him, though, that we need a, a, a come-to-Jesus moment on this thing. That would solve all of the problems. You know, it was one issue that Jesus really did address when they tried to trap him on an issue on divorce, remarriage, and everything. He said, listen, God created man and woman. And he would know, based on solid Christian theology, he would know. That's why the, the first miracle, the wedding at Cana of Galilee, is such a tremendous, unbelievable, theological, not unbelievable, but true thing that you need to know about who this person was who was standing there changing water into wine. And so when he speaks about male-female, we ought to listen to him. And so we do need to come to Jesus' moment. Um, this is happening. You know, he, he said this, I, though, they make up this thing about some schools are allowing children to identify as cats. It, it doesn't take long to find it, Ben. You know, get, get, a, get a thing called an internet connection. Go to Google. You like Google? It'll direct you right to it. And this is happening. It's, you cannot tell me that all these parents are standing up saying, this is not happening. They read from books in the library, and they get shut down at the meeting because they're reading pornography. And then they said, but I got the book from your library that you're letting my kid read. And they act like, and this is the problem. It's just like when you make an argument against abortion as to what really happens, all these people that support abortion, they go, that's not true. That's not what happens. You know, it's, it's all puppy dogs and rainbows, man. And, the whole, and they just, they can't deal with the reality. And so the, the, the point in Bible prophecy, though, is when we live in a culture like this, a world like this, where people cannot, they fall for, the, they'll fall, they fall for this delusional lie. And there's a big lie coming. And a big liar that's going to be spouting it, is it likely that people will fall for that? And it's going to be people on all sides of the political spectrum, mind you. Not just this. This is just an example. So here's an article. This is an article from uh, the UK from uh, the website Christian Concern. And at Christian Concern, it talks about um, this preacher uh, he was, uh, here's what the article says, a criminal prosecution against a street preacher arrested for an alleged hate crime has been dropped in which the Crown Prosecution Service, so this is the prosecutor, prosecuting attorney in Britain, argued that parts of the Bible are abusive and no longer appropriate in modern society. John Dunn, a cancer survivor from Swindon who had served uh, served in the British Army Special Forces, was interviewed under caution and subsequently summoned by the police for alleged homophobia after preaching on Swindon High Street in November 2020. Mr. Dunn, who regularly preaches despite having lost his voice box following throat cancer, is a Bible-believing Christian who preaches in Swindon Town Center. He considers, and by the way, if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, you know, send me an email, and I'll we'll send it to our Department of Corrections and see if it's worthy to correct. Because um, it, it's, I forget where I was in the UK. We were having a 
thing. And I said, well, it's at, it's at this place. And it's, no, no, the W is silent. And so a bunch of other letters. Like, well, how am I supposed to know that? Uh, he also considers preaching in the street and speaking God's truth to be an essential part of his Christian calling. As part of his message, he often refers to Genesis 1 being made in God's image, male and female, and marriage between one man and woman being God's purpose and pattern for the good of society. And then he also talks about 1 Corinthians 6 and homosexuality and that type of thing. And the prosecutor said, listen, this is not, this is not acceptable in modern society. Now, fortunately, the court said, prosecutors, you're, you're off base and you can't do that. So now I want to do, I'm going to sort of play a little bit of a few clips of I did last week because I want to set up this climate change thing that's going on. So first we're going to do Prince Charles from COP27 or COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland a year ago in which he said this. As we tackle this crisis, our efforts cannot be a series of independent initiatives running in parallel. The scale and scope of the threat we face call for a global systems level solution based on radically transforming our current fossil fuel based economy to one that is genuinely renewable and sustainable. So, ladies and gentlemen, my plea today is for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector. With trillions at its disposal, far beyond global GDP, and with the greatest respect, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders, it offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. And it is. It's going to be a complete transition. And he issued, uh, shortly, uh, a few months before the meeting, this manifesto of his called Terra Carta. And he says in there that this is, this is sort of my building off uh, something like the Magna Carta, which dealt with human rights. And so now I have my Terra Carta. Now at the, so we had the COP27 meeting in Sharm El Sheikh. And out of that, they've agreed to, at least the rich countries of the world claim to have agreed to, rep essentially reparations to poorer countries. Even though, for example, the United States will pay reparations to Vietnam and Thailand and some other countries, which are the, some of the biggest coal producing countries on, in the world. They're making money off coal, but we're going to pay them because, well, we use coal. But you produce it, and it's, it's socialism, it's centralized government on an epic scale. But then at the meetings they had after COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, everybody trundled over to Asia, to Indonesia, which used to be a very large coal-producing country, by the way. And they had a meeting, and at the meeting, this health minister from Indonesia, who really... It's never worked in health. He was a banker before. So I guess bankers can now go pronounce things on health policy. And if we want to hear something about banking, we should go talk to the health people uh, to give them an opportunity to weigh in on something that they don't know anything about or no, don't know a lot about. But in the, in the document coming out of the G20 meeting, and they also had a business meeting, B20, it was the 20 biggest economies in the world, and all the leaders were there except, I, think, I don't think Putin made it because he sent Lavrov in his place. But here's this health minister, and he talks about, and this made it into the final document. And this is, I played this last week, but I think it's worth replaying again. So here's what he says about one of the things they want to achieve from this meeting. So let's have a digital health certificate acknowledged by WHO 
if you have been vaccinated or tested properly, then you can move around. So for the next pandemic, instead of stopping the movement of the people 100%, which clogged the economy globally, you know, you can still provide some movement of the people. Indonesia has achieved, G20 country has agreed to have this digital certificate using WHO standard, and we will submit into the next the, uh, World Health Assembly in Geneva as the revision to international health regulation. So hopefully for the next pandemic, we can still see some movement of the people, some movement of the goods, and movement of the economy. And so this is all tied into central bank digital currencies, and these are being built all over the world. There's a pilot program going on in the United States between the Federal Reserve and 12 major banks, finance companies, that type of thing. Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, others sort of testing a central bank digital currency. Now, a lot of people will say, well, this is not going to happen. It's going to take them a long time to build this. It's Listen, when they're testing it, all they got to do is implement it. And so this week I was, I was out by the server farms and out there in New Albany for Facebook and Amazon, and then Google's building this, these water towers, backup transformers, everything out there. It's, it's unbelievable. They're spending like, what, $3.5 billion? And it's all data. It's all these big buildings to store data. And these central bank digital currencies will be tied to it. Here is a guy uh, from the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, which is often referred to the Bank of International Settlements as the central banks, central bank of central banks. And here's what it Our analysis on CBDC in particular for the use of general, to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also, we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important, and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. Uh, so they, you hear it from his own mouth, total control. And they're going to make determinations. Uh, okay. Haller House. We know you didn't eat turkey this Thanksgiving. You had steak. Uh, you shouldn't be buying any steak for about three months based on the amount of steak that we saw at your house. And they'll know because it's just, it's just flipping a switch. But in addition to the, the currency part, here's Klaus Schwab back in 2019 at the Chicago Council for Global Affairs talking about what else he thinks needs to happen. And now, the fourth industrial revolution is not just a prolongation of this digitalization. It's much more. Um, it's a combination of technologies. It's not just the digital technology. Just think of genetics, think of brain research, and so on. And the power of the fourth industrial revolution comes from the combination of all those technologies. Actually, I was uh, saying um, it's at the end what, what the fourth industrial revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities. And that's what he wants. And then how do they roll that out? This is him speaking in 2017 at the Harvard School of Government, the Center for Public Leadership, which, by the way, was started, I believe, based on what I was able to gather from a Whitney Webb interview, the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard School of Business, Harvard School of Government, was started by a grant from a guy named Les Wexner, who's local. 
In fact, he lives out there by those New Albany, not too far from those server farms in New Albany. Uh, and a friend of Jeffrey, you know who, who um, it's reported that he took his own life in jail. Um, I know he hasn't been seen since that I can verify. And so here he is speaking about uh, how they're, how he's implementing this through the World Economic Forum with David Gergen, by the way, who is a big Democratic supporter, worked in a lot of Democratic administrations. When you brought the Young Global Leaders Program here for executive education and the Schwab Fellows, but there are two countries in the world now in which the Young Global Leaders have emerged. Tell us just a bit about that in, in terms of the governance. Yes, um, actually... This um, notion to integrate young leaders uh, <coughs> is part of the World Economic Forum for since many years. And I have to say, um, when I mention now names like Sis Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation, like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau, and I know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet, are for our actually young global leaders of the world economic forum. Tina, and uh, it's true in France now, mm -hmm. I'm here with the president, with a young global leader, but... So here's McCrean. We are in a jungle, and we week. have two big elephants trying to become more and more nervous. If they become very nervous and start war, it will be a big problem for the whole, the rest of the jungle. You need cooperation of a lot of other animals. <laughs> Tigers, monkeys, and so on. Are you on the US and the Chinese side? Because now, progressively, a lot of people would like to see there, there are two orders in this world. This is a huge mistake. Even for both the US and China. We need a single global order. So that's him. And by the way, the, the logo there, that was the APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Council Summit uh, in Thailand, uh, right after, so they had, they had the uh, COP27, then they have in Egypt, and they have uh, G20, B20 in Indonesia, then they go to Thailand for APEC, and that they're all following each other all around in these different places. Now, this is the logo art piece for the uh, APEC 2022. So I want to make a clarification as to what I see. Some people see a certain symbol that was in 1930s, 1940s Germany embedded in that, but it's, it's not the same. It's the, the last piece is going the opposite direction that the symbol from Germany goes. But this is an old um, Hindu, sun god, ancient religious symbol for the sun and that type of thing. In fact, if you want to see a symbol like this, if you ever have time and you're up in Cleveland, go out to Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland Heights. They're on the border between Cleveland and Cleveland Heights, right up near the lake. That's why they call it Lakeview. And it's very interesting to go there because you will see there... Um, Eastern mystical religious influence in the cemetery. For one, they have, for what's supposedly a Christian cemetery, all the graves, at least in one section, have obelisk on them. The tallest obelisk, by the way, is over the grave of a man named John D. Rockefeller Sr., who's buried there, who lived in Cleveland when he was building Standard Oil. And it, at one point, some people estimate he was the richest man who ever lived, uh, by some estimates, at least in terms of, uh, so if you say that Elon Musk had, has a fortune of $200 billion in today's terms, 
Rockefeller's fortune would have been somewhere around 650 to 800 billion dollars. So he was pretty wealthy. That's why there are a couple generations, a few generations past him, and they're all still pretty wealthy. And the Rockefeller Foundation does a lot of work. But also in that cemetery is a giant, round, pointed top mausoleum. It's the largest presidential mausoleum in, in the United States for James Garfield, who was only president, by the way, for eight months back in the 1880s. He was assassinated. Uh, shot in a train station, I believe. But the it's a round thing with a point at top. And if you look, go in there near where his coffin is, you can see his coffin sitting right there in the in the one room. There's a schematic there, and the schematic is that that building is to represent the core of a pyramid, which gets into these Masonic religions and all of this other stuff. And he was a Christian minister. But in the floor, embedded in the floor around his coffin, is this symbol. I have pictures of it. You can go up there and see it. So I think there's, there's a tie here. It was in Thailand, and there's a tie, T-I-E, to this whole religious thing that's going on. That's my opinion. Now, I don't agree that this is a symbol from Germany, but it's a religious symbol nonetheless. And it's used, and nobody seems to be bothered by what it might mean or what it might incorporate. So at APEC 27, not only did he speak over at G20, B20 conference, Klaus Schwab shows up again, and he's interviewed by Chinese television. So here's a couple minute clip of what he had to say. Well, you'll hear, you can hear what he said. On the G20, you were there meeting some of the leaders as well. Professor Schwab, what do you make of the result? Finally, they put something as a statement, and it seems quite positive with all the voices included. I think it's positive. It's uh, already positive through the fact that everybody agreed about the statement, which we haven't had the last years. Now, the base has been formed, but um, we have to go one step further. We have to have a strategic mood. We have to construct the world of tomorrow. It's a systemic transformation of the world. So we have to define how the world should look like, which we want to come out of this transformation period. Mm. For example, nature and environment, uh, climate change, and then to see what are uh, actually the areas where we can make true progress, uh, where we can have a real impact. I just take climate change. I mean, it's such a complex issue. It concerns not only the reduction of CO2 in industries, it's uh, a change of lifestyle, we need substantial innovation, we have um, uh, to look for nature-based solutions. For example, I'm very glad uh, that uh, uh, China is integrated into our initiative to plant one trillion trees in the next 10 years by making its own contribution. Uh, so, so is a whole, let's say, a holistic a, a, a panoply of um, issues, and for each if issue, we have to try with a collaborative platform where we integrate the best people, the most relevant people, and then to work for progress. I mean, he speaks like he's got a PowerPoint in front of him, almost. You know, the three point, the bullet points on everything that he says. So that was an inset that one clip was of Xi Jinping speaking at the 2017 conference, uh, the Davos World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And you saw Schwab praising the Chinese model, did you not? In that little clip for Chinese television. But what's going on in China right now? Go look up. Go look at Twitter. Go look at the videos. Beijing is in, there's 
maybe 400 million people in lockdown. And it's brutal. They've installed nets under the windows of, of office buildings and apartment buildings. So pe because people were jumping to their death. This is, this is brutality. It's, it's unbelievable. And he's praising it. I, um, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. And I saw people on Twitter, I think Taylor Lorenz, who's a lunatic lefty on Twitter, um, she may block me. I don't know. Let's, I'll live with that. Um, talking about we need to have these lockdowns. Stop criticizing China over these things. They're just trying to save lives, you know. So let's look at a couple things. So let's look first real quickly at this thing in Ukraine. So regardless of how I speak about this, everybody's, I'm going to get criticized by one side or the other. So here's my thinking. Uh, Russia's not done particularly well. They have used a lot of their stores of ammunition, artillery, and even some missiles. There are reports that some of the missiles they're using are nuclear missile cruise missiles. They've taken the nuclear thing off and put munitions on to launch into Ukraine. And what they've done has just been brutal. Now, in the long scheme of things, um, Putin claims he's calling up another couple million people. It's going to be very difficult for Ukraine. And it, it's, it's already, it's getting to this point where he's now destroyed 50% or more of the electricity generating capacity of the country. And it's winter. And it gets very, very cold there in winter. So whether there's another Russian offensive coming, Ukraine says they're going to take things back. They want the Crimean Peninsula. I'm just saying is I don't know that this thing is over anytime soon. And it's not, I don't think it's turned out the way Putin wanted it. I remember reading all this stuff. He's going to, they're going to roll over this in two weeks. And now what are we talking about? It's been nine months. Uh, and there's still problems. They've lost a lot of territory um, that they had gained but they've destroyed the infrastructure of Ukraine on an epic scale. Surgeons working in the dark. Uh, here's uh, the water and power is out everywhere. I mean, here's a picture of uh, one of the cities. Here's people gathering in a, in a tent um, type place. You can see they got all their phones plugged in uh, because they don't have heat at home. They don't have water. This was pulled off the satellite at night. You can see, look at this. Ukraine almost looks like the Black Sea. Why is the Black Sea black? Well, not because it is black, but because at night it is black because there's no buildings there. But look at Ukraine. It's been um, destroyed. Now the NATO people are saying, man, we may have used up all of our weapons fighting this. This is an article from a German newspaper about, you know, alarm about Kiev. Power grid, colossal destruction. Gas proms coming back and saying they're going to cut everything off in Europe. There's just a little bit of gas getting through. Here's this big article. And what this article essentially is saying is, listen, Switzerland... You usually claim you're neutral in everything. You cannot be neutral in this. This is Germany telling Switzerland they cannot be neutral. But look at the imagery that's used in the picture here on the right. Uh, here, I got a bigger copy of it. So this is supposedly Switzerland looking at what's going on in Ukraine. And do you see what they've done to the people there? Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. You're ignoring what's going on. Uh, this is from Wall Street Journal, uh, sabotage on pipelines. Oil shipping has been disrupted all over the world. It is uh, the price of shipping a container. An uh, oil tanker used to be $40,000 a day. Now, they hold, I don't know how many 
hundreds of millions of uh, gallons or barrels of, uh, of uh, oil. Now they are going for about $115,000 a day. And it's completely reshaping global supply chains. So they used to deliver stuff from, say, Russia uh, to Netherlands, which was a four-day trip. Now they're delivering that stuff to India, which is a 35-day trip. It's just, everything's disrupted. So I don't think we're out of this on a global economic scale anytime soon. Uh, costs are going up. Uh, utility costs are going up. Uh, Europe seems to be doing a little bit okay right now because they've had a fairly mild fall, late fall and uh, going into early winter. So they've got a lot of their storage capacity filled up, but what they usually do is they fill that storage capacity while they're drawing down on it during the winter so they always have it filled up. And now Russia's been cut off with gas. Nord Stream's been destroyed. Um, gas prompts cutting off the last bit. And so 40% of Europe's gas supply goes away, and Europe's getting upset with the United States. Why? Well, we just happen to have a lot of liquefied natural gas capacity, so we're shipping a lot of gas to Europe. But it costs like 10 times what gas coming in by pipeline costs. And Europe's starting to resent the fact that the Americans seem to be making a lot of money off of this war on our doorstep. So... <laughs> There's a lot of tension going on everywhere. So let me look at this. So um, quickly on this, this is uh, terror attacks in Jerusalem. Uh, this is unusual. This has not happened for over 15 years. A uh, couple of bomb went off at a bus stop. Uh, two have been killed. Uh, one died. This is the headlines from the day after, but uh, another one died, I think, yesterday or today. A uh, man from, who had made Aliyah from Ethiopia and been in Israel for about 22 years. Uh, this is the Lebanese paper. You know, they're talking about, oh, you know, this is such a great thing that we're doing. Um, and we, we like this. Iranian hackers have released security camera footage of Jerusalem bombing. So here's what one of the bombings looked like. It's nothing... Unusual, but if you look in the middle there, you'll see that as this uh, one car goes by, um, this white car here, there you go, boom. And that's the one that killed a couple people. There was another one that uh, happened, a, a Druze individual was in a car accident and injured in a car accident up in Samaria. He was taken to the hospital, he was on life support, and about 40 armed Palestinian terrorists came in and kidnapped him, and he died. And then they had to negotiate getting the body back. He was Druze, uh, and they had his funeral the other day. This is an editorial cartoon from one of the, I think, Al Arabi newspaper, an Arab newspaper that is this lighting the match to what's going to happen. Um... There's a BBC commentator who referred to this. Look at what his tweet is here. He says this, when he was tweeting about the attack in Jerusalem, of course, the World Cup's going on in Qatar. That's where a bunch of soccer teams get together and tie 0-0 in most of their matches, and everybody gets all excited about what a wonderful match that was. But that's my commentary. Uh, two explosions with explosive devices in occupied Jerusalem, Killing, this is a BBC-paid commentator, by the way. Killing an Israeli, wounding many, and the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade kidnapping the body of a settler in Jenin. It is the beginning of a very different Palestinian World Cup, and people are just livid about this. This guy also wrote this article uh, at this uh, website, Raya, rayelyum.com, The Resurgence of Palestinian Resistance, it's called. He says, I've been predicting this for months, that there would be a resurgence of the resistance to occupation in the occupied West Bank. And there is. And the question is, what, why is it going on? Why is it happening now? Well, um, I can't remember who I read made this comment. It might have been Carol Englert. That they're sort of waiting for Mahmoud Abbas to die. Because he's old. He's 86, 87 you know, he was elected to a four-year term in 2003. 
So he's now into the 19th year of a four-year term. Uh, and Palestinian society is very tribal. There's a lot of factions. And so what people are doing is they're engaging in these terrorist acts so that they'll have the political capital goodwill. Look at what we do to these settlers, the, Ara the Israelis who occupy us and torture us. So there's, there's probably going to be an uptick in this, I guess is what I'm saying. On I-24 News, uh, General Amir Avivi from the Israeli Defense and Security Forum was interviewed the other day about his views on these attacks and uh, these terror attacks. This is only about a minute and a half long. A kind of attack uh, requires a lot of planning. It's a very, it's a very well planned, planned attack. We haven't seen an attack like that more than six years in Jerusalem. Uh, all that we have seen in the last few months is mainly attacks with knives, sometimes uh, shooting, but not this kind of attack with improvised explosive uh, devices in a major Israeli city in our capital. Uh, it's obvious that uh, there is a big organization behind that. We know that in the last few months the Iranians have been involved deeply in what is going on in the areas of Judea and Samaria, coordinating with Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. We have also factions of Fatah that are involved in terror. So it remains to see, according to the intelligence that the Shabak will bring, what, what uh, actually happened here and who is behind it. What do you make of the fact that no organization has officially claimed responsibility, even though some have praised what happened, no one has come forward and said this was our doing? I think that uh, they are worried about uh, Israel's retaliation. We see uh, in Gaza, Hamas uh, preparing defensively, preparing its rockets, uh, looking at the possibility where Israel will, ta will retaliate, uh, and this means that maybe they are responsible uh, of what has happened. It's not the first time that we see a situation where an organization like Hamas carries an attack but doesn't take responsibility. Uh, usually it's because they, they are worried about uh, what, how will Israel respond to such an attack. So that's, uh, you can, if you want to listen to more to General Vivi, you can go to the IDSF, Israeli Defense and Security Forum uh, website, also their YouTube channel, subscribe. Um, um, he's, he's doing good work, and I, I know him personally. I've spent some time talking, a lot of hours talking to him, so uh, I would recommend him as a voice to be listened to because I think he really understands what's going on. One of the things he advocates for is that Israel should develop a National Guard. Like, we have a National Guard here in the United States, and I think it's, it's a pretty good point. Here's another example. This is um, Beersheba. And so what you see the car there running down on the right, running down an Israeli uh, Air Force airman. And this happens all the time down in the Negev. These Bedouins are constantly running. Oh, we just accidentally ran over an Israeli. Um. And so this is Caroline Glick tweeting, this is an Israeli Bedouin driving onto the sidewalk to run over a soldier in Israel's Air Force. This is not a rare event. Nearly every Jewish business in southern Israel is compelled to pay protection to Bedouin crime gangs. And the prior government didn't do anything about it, so there's hope that the new government that's coming in uh, will actually uh, do something about it. And there is some uh, news on that front. I think I think this is this morning's Jerusalem Post that there's been a united the religious Zionist party have signed a coalition deal with the Likud uh, Ben Gavir who's uh, a lot of people claim as a terrorist and I'm not going to get into that argument right now he's going to get sort of the interior defense ministry uh, position and so he's like we got to stop this. We just we can't live like this. We cannot allow this to go on. So the nego negotiations continue for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu of Likud to form a government. So now I want to talk about uh, this for most of the rest of the time is the Iranian influence about what's going on. There's a excellent article at Tablet Magazine called Overmatch. It's by Michael Duran. And um, I can't remember the other person's name, and I can't read it. It's too small for my old eyes. But what it's talking about is this phenomenon that we're seeing is this development 
of Iran as a major problem in the Middle East and around the world. Don't think that they don't have influence in this hemisphere through Venezuela and others. And what, who all, how do we know who's been coming across the border, right? Five million people since uh, the Biden administration came in? We have a problem. And Iran is doing this, and so what they're saying, and this is an article from early November, Iran's increasingly sophisticated drone and missile strike packages are driving America's beleaguered allies to seek protection in Beijing. And so across the Middle East, governments are saying, listen, you know, the United States doesn't seem to be helping us, and we can't fight off this Iranian thing by ourselves because of the way they're financed and what they're doing and the technology that they've developed. So we need help. Listen to what some of this article says. In the Middle East today, the United States has once again drawn its defensive perimeter in a highly ambiguous fashion. The ambiguity has emboldened China, Russia, and Iran, and sown mistrust in the hearts of allies. The Biden administration has failed to recognize the problem and therefore has not begun to address it. Like marriages gone sour and houses in Malibu, international orders erode gradually at first and then all at once. News of the demise of the American order in the Middle East is certainly premature, but the ground beneath it is shifting in very unsettling ways that American policymakers appear determined to ignore. And the Biden administration is doing this. And you remember, this was uh, on one of the jihadi Twitter pages a while back. Aurora Intel published it. And it was, what, what do we see here? Is we see a drone attack on the Burj Al Dubai, which is the largest, oh, it's the Burj Al Khalifa, because they named it after the, the uh, former pre the president who died last year from the United Arab Emirates. But this is a drone attack on the largest, tallest building in the world. And this is, this is what's going on, and the Iranians are uh, exploiting things this way. They're getting involved in Ukraine. Yet in what, the article continues in tablet, yet in what has become a clear pattern since the arrival of President Biden in office, American forces launched no militarily significant response to what in effect was an Iranian attack on American forces, an event in terms of its geopolitical impact was every bit as important as the widely reported news that Iran is supplying the armies of, U of Russian leader Vladimir Putin with missile and drone packages for use in the Ukraine war. And the attack that they referred to was the one that occurred a few days after the assassination of um, Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad. There was an attack on a U.S. air base. Now, the U.S. air base, U.S. had advance notice of that, and they couldn't defend against the attack. This is the problem, is you cannot defend the whole world against these type of attacks. So you either have to take out their capability and destroy their capability, or you're going to have to deal with the problem. So, and this is a problem that, is, that Israel faces. I've talked about this many times. If the war in the north breaks loose, Hezbollah has tens of thousands of missiles. Iron Dome's not going to stop it. Laser technology is not going to stop it. You cannot protect against all of these missiles. And even if you can stop 90% of them, 10% of them can really have a major impact on your country and your economy. And this is the great fear. How do we handle this? So <coughs> the article continues. In fact, the developments of the Arabian Gulf and Ukraine are linked. Saudi Arabia and the UAE have been on the receiving end of sophisticated Iranian missiles and drones for around five years now. The immunity from counterattack that Iran has enjoyed has emboldened it to support Russia. Moreover, it has set America's Gulf allies on a quest for security that increasingly is taking them out of the arms of the United States and into the waiting embrace of China. That's problematic. We see what China does and what they will do with this. So, um, for example, in the National, back in October, they referenced the meeting that uh, General Frank... McKinsey had talked at, he was the retiring CENTCOM commander. It was at the London, a London forum. I wasn't able to find a video of it, but I was able to find some quotes. But last week on Israeli Channel 7, um, 
General McKenzie was interviewed, and he was asked about the Iranian threat. And I thought he had some very solid, good information to say. You might want to zoom this out for the video. Here it is. My point would be this. Over the last 10 years, and accelerating over the last five years, Iran has uh, put remarkable emphasis on building a trinity of capabilities. And that trinity is composed of theater range ballistic missiles, land attack cruise missiles, and unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs. What they have done is they have, they have starved their people, they have perverted their economy, and they have denied a lot of things in order to build these capabilities. To the point now where we really have a new situation in the region, where I will tell you the latter part of my time as the commander of Central Command, and from what I see now, the great daily threat in the region is what comes of these three allied Iranian capabilities. Because what it does is it gives them the ability to gain overmatch against their Gulf neighbors. The range of their missiles is, they have a few that can hit Israel, not a whole lot. Although, as you know, they're trying to build more and they're trying to put more into, into Lebanon as well. So that's a, that's, that's a concern. But they have the, the thousands and thousands of theater ballistic missiles, which give them the ability to really uh, impose a tremendous uh, burden on their neighbors should they choose to do that. That's very concerning. And I think that's, you know, in the spring of 2021, we were talking about going back into the JICPOA, uh, reestablishing some form of a nuclear agreement. And then from the United States, uh, our president said, then we'd like to look at ballistic missiles and proxies. Well, the Iranian response was electric. And it wasn't so much about the nuclear component as about the ballistic missiles and the proxy component, saying they will never, ever allow modification or, you know, we'll never negotiate to reduce these capabilities. I think we should view the crown jewel of Iranian offensive capability as those missiles, UAVs, and land attack cruise missiles, because they pose a, they pose a threat tonight. The nuclear threat, uh, the Iranians continue to plot along. You know, they could have a weapon probably pretty quick if they chose to do that. It would take them a while to deliver a, to present a deliverable weapon. By that, I mean something that could be weaponized and put on top of a missile or hauled in an airplane somewhere. That's going to take them a little time to do once they make the decision to do it. On the other hand, these missiles, Blackhams and UAVs, are available now. And I sometimes am concerned that they sit in the shadow because we focus so much on the nuclear deal, which is concerning and is the policy of my country that Iran not possess a nuclear weapon. But in the meantime, Iran has built significant ballistic missile capability. And the last point I would make on ballistic missiles is in January of 2020, when they launched an attack on us at Al-Assad, their missiles were accurate to within tens of meters of their target. That's a huge increase in accuracy. And they've only improved since January of 2020. They're probably more accurate now, more capable. And this trend is going to continue. And I find it uh, one of the most concerning trends in the region. And he's right. It's a, it's a, it's a huge concern. And so when General Kachavi, uh, the head of the uh, Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, went to Washington this week to meet with people at the Pentagon and elsewhere, uh, he was talking about, you know, we need to significantly ex expand what CENTCOM can do because of the Iranian threat. In the Arab News yesterday, there was this editorial, Iran's drones allow it to export instability. And this is the whole point. It's an overmatch, as Michael Duran's article said in Tablet Magazine, as General McKenzie said, and as General Kachavi has said himself, that this is a big deal. The development of these drones. My friend Seth Fransman at Jerusalem Post wrote a book on drones last year or two years ago. Uh, and it's, it's as relevant today as it was then because this is a big deal because of the ability of countries to, um, what's the term, punch above their weight class. You know, you're a 150 pounder, but you can act like a heavyweight. That's, that's a problem. And it costs a lot more to defend against it than it does to create the mayhem. So they can take a $20,000 drone, and we want to, you know, it, you can spend millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to shoot these things down. And you're not going to get all of them. And Ukraine's shooting down a lot of these drones. 
and a lot of missiles. But look at what Ukraine looks like today. They have no power this winter. People will freeze to death. And that's apart from what's going on there. So this is an article from the UK Times uh, yesterday. Drones versus drones over Ukraine are reinventing war. And that's exactly right. There's also a component about it. Uh, there was this uh, video report earlier this week from Al-Hadeth, which is a, uh, a Saudi-based group. And you know sometimes they have problems with credibility. But what they said was that Hezbollah had acquired a store of chemical weapons on missiles that they were ready to use. Now, the question is, are they credible? So Alma Research, which does a great job, it's located in North Israel, they have an article that they came out with, and they said, you know, we're not so sure that it's going to be that big of a problem. We doubt that Hezbollah would launch a chemical weapon into Israel. They might use chemical weapons on Israeli soldiers who are actually inside Lebanon because they view that as less of a risk to them because if they, if they launch something into Israel, it's over. Southern Lebanon is toast. I mean, I'm just telling you, Israel will not stand for that. And they will, you remember the video I played from you like four years ago of the Israeli Air Force head at the time? who said, listen, you know, we were involved in Lebanon and back in 2006, 33-day uh, or 35-day war. He goes, we're going to do in 48 to 72 hours, 24 to 72 hours, what we, it took us 33 days to do. It will be shock and awe like you've never seen it. So if he Hezbollah knows if they trigger this the wrong way. So I'm not sure how credible the Al-Hadeth uh, report is from Saudi Arabia, but it's still... It's still an important issue. Uh, and so McKinsey, again, was saying what he had said at the uh, London Policy Exchange on October 6th. He sort of reiterated that in the Channel 7 interview that I just played for you. Um, and so he talked about, so here's what he said, though. Um, I think that over the past five to seven years, Iranian capabilities, this is what he said in London about two months ago. Over the past five to seven years, the Iranian capabilities in these three domains have risen to such a degree that they now possess what I would call effective overmatch against their neighbors. Overmatch is a military term that means you have the ability to attack and your defender will not be able to mount a successful defense. It's a pretty simple equation. And despite spending millions and millions on defense. And then Salami has come out. He's one of the generals of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and says... We can do whatever we want. And the article that Duran wrote in early November says this, Salami's statement was not mere bluster. Iran can supply the armed forces of Russian Federation with drones and missiles for the invasion of Ukraine, in part because its products are worth buying, and in part because it no longer fears an American response to the actions that might lead to battlefield deaths of NATO advisors. That's because whether from its own territory or from Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, or Gaza, Iran can strike a major population centers in the critical national infrastructure of every Middle Eastern country that relies on the United States for its security. The tanker traffic through the state of Hormoz is easy pickings, as is every American base in the Middle East. The integration of Western technology will also make Iran's weapons much more attractive on the international arms markets. And then it says this, Iran... Hezbollah, Iran's premier proxy, remember that was one of the triad that General McKenzie referred to, boasts the second largest missile arsenal in the Middle East, greater than that of either Turkey or Israel. So the article goes on, um, Iran's disruptive military capacity has shifted the balance of power in the Gulf for two basic reasons. First, the defense economics work decidedly in Tehran's favor. Um, and then, I don't know if I put the second part in here. But anyway, so um, yet the growing sophistication, the last sentence here, of uh, the IRGC's drone and missile package combined with the Biden administration's favorite strategy of regional integration, highlighted most recently by the U.S.-sponsored Israeli gas deal with Hezbollah, makes a more relaxed posture even less sustainable. 
Founded on the idea of a balance of a deterrence, the Biden administration's regional integration strategy intentionally limits the threat that Israel can pose to the IRGC and its proxies, thereby making an Iran attack more likely while restraining any Israeli response. The RGC's defense network can now supply the world's second largest arms exporter in a high tempo invasion at NATO's doorstep. And so this is this war that's going on between Israel, or I mean, Israel and Iran. And this does play into Bible prophecy. And again, I don't want to get into when Ezekiel 38 and 39 occurs. I think it's at the end. Okay, that's my, at the end of this period, just before the Lord returns. That's just more and more my conclusion. Uh, but I think, it's going to, I think it's going to extend out over a period of time. It's not going to be a one-day thing. It's going to be... A, a campaign, I guess. It's not going to be overnight. That's that's what I'm trying to say. <coughs> and so this week in uh, Syria, a, a top Iranian general was taken out in a strike. Uh, Israel never takes credit for that. This was the article that I showed you last week. 400 seconds to Jerusalem is what they're saying. Uh, at the same time, all this is going on, there is, uh, this is kind of interesting, because I don't know, I don't know if Russia survives, okay? I know I'm getting a lot of trouble for saying that. They've got problems, and this is sort of like their, <coughs> excuse me, this is sort of like their last chance, their last hurrah to do this because of their demographic problems, and the fact that the ethnic Russians are declining, but other Minorities like the Chechen and Muslims are increasing. So I, I don't know. But the other thing, and I've talked about this for a long time, is in a, the uh, Stan Republics organizing somehow into a coalition, that, a coalition that fits into the Ezekiel 38 scenario. Because I know Turkey's involved. Uh, I don't know if it's Erdogan's going to be the leader. He's up for election next year. He may not make it. I don't know. But this is another meeting that they had recently, the uh, Council of the Heads of the State of, or of the Organization of Turkey Stakes, because they have an ethnic and religious and language capacity. So this is a, a graphic that shows these countries. Uh, and you, you can make the case that this is the Gog Magog area, uh, biblically, historically. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see how it plays out. That's my my view on it. Um, let's see. Syria, praising Iran and Hezbollah as key allies. Uh, this is the new economist. They always have these sort of predictive things frozen out, talking about how the world is leaving Europe behind. And that's kind of interesting, depending on your view of Bible prophecy and how this final beast income comes. And then this is just being released. This is, they always have that looking forward thing. You know, they always have the world in 2017, 2018. Now it's called the world ahead 2023. And they always put kind of imagery and that type of thing on the cover. And I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. I just found it this morning. So listen, all of this stuff is sort of driving towards this conclusion. It's accelerating, it's converging, the logistical aspects of what appears to be the beast system and the beast kingdom and a central currency that's controllable just by a switch, it seems to be coming together. In those protests, by the way, in China, you know what they're doing? The people who go to the protest, to move around, you have a QR code on your phone. And if it's green, you're cool. Remember, I talked about this. Somebody was going to go to a protest of a small bank that he had money in, and they were clamping down on the banks, and people couldn't get their money out of the bank. So he was going to a protest, and as he's getting off the train to go through the turnstile, his code flips to red. Why? They knew where he was. They knew where he was going. And they turned him off. And so the reports are all, I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people protesting in China right now. And the word is, all of their QR codes are turning red. Because somebody wants to control them. 
the one who Klaus Schwab was praising as a great model. Boy. So, it, look, it's all coming together. So all the things that we've talked about today, you know, sort of the alliances in the Middle East taking shape, the beast system taking place, the government control and central currency taking place, you can find all of that in Bible prophecy. So listen, prepare your hearts, stay in the Word, because it could be a very difficult world to live in. I'm not going to sugarcoat it here. Uh, but in the end, Jesus comes back, and we know that. And we can count on that, and we can share that great hope with people um, through the gospel. So let's pray. Jesus, Lord, thank you so much for the information that you've given us so that we can live at a time like this. We pray that you will help us to take this to heart, to follow the word, to stand firm in the faith, uh, as it says in Corinthians, and act like men, and stand for the truth of the word of God and the truth of what you did for all of us on the cross and your burial, your, de your death, your burial, and your resurrection, your return to heaven, and your return to the earth to set up your kingdom. Uh, bless us this week, Lord. Give us opportunities to share that message with others. In Jesus' name, amen.